Hã? Não, sem nada. Isso aí, ei, 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 ei. Iê, ei. Iê, ei. Tout va bien Gardez ouvert dans, dans oui, la main. Oui. Non, ça devrait aller. On a des ingénieurs qui sont là-haut. Parfait. Okay, bah, je, je garde... Très bien. Il faut juste, il faut juste pas l'approcher d'un autre micro. Non, non. D'accord. Okay. Moi, je resterai, je serai soit ici en train de parler, d'aller de l'autre côté. Je, je vais juste me balader un peu. Ok. Super.
Everybody, um, if I could ask everyone to take their seats. We are starting a bit late and we would like to start in the next minute or so. Thank you very much. So a very, very warm welcome to everybody, a very warm welcome to our speakers here. Now this is a high level session where we are going to be focusing on how to ensure inclusion, imperatives and development gains are central to global digital trade. Now as we have been hearing yesterday, ensuring all economies get a fair share of digital trade is one of the most important goals of E-Trade for All. And, and not coincidentally, all our speakers come from partner organizations of that platform. So today we are joined by the decision makers, the decision makers who are helping lead change. They're helping shape the future and influence policy directions. And I can tell you, it's a real privilege to be with them today. Now, this is a multi-stakeholder strategic session. And we're gonna reflect on lessons that have been learned, but also address what actions must be taken to spur the digital transformation in developing countries and really very important at this point in time, shrink those digital divides in order to leverage inclusive, sustainable development. Now, let's welcome our speakers. And when I say your name, give a little wave, just in case people don't know who you are. So I'm absolutely delighted that we're joined by Mia Seppo. Now, Mia Seppo is the Assistant Director General for Jobs and Social Protection of the ILO. Welcome. Fantastic also to have Dorothy Tembo who is with us. Now she is the Deputy Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Welcome to you. We're also joined by Anna joubin brett who is the Secretary General of the United Nations Commission of International Trade Law, that's known as ANCITRAL. From the WTO, we're joined by Anna joubin brett who, who is the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. Absolutely great to have you with us, thank you. We're also joined by Pradeep Mehta, who is the Secretary General of CUTS, which is and represents civil society. And thank you so much for being with us today. And he, in some respects, is our think tank voice. We're also joined by Paul Donohoe. Hello, Paul, who is a digital policies and trade coordinator from the Universal Postal Union. And hello and good morning. We are joined by Koji Hashiyama, who is the chief operating officer of economic research from the Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. So we are gonna be speaking hearing from our speakers in just a few moments. But first of all, for our opening remarks, it is really my great pleasure to invite a woman who has just whizzed around the world to be with you here today from COP28. And that is, of course, Rebecca Greenspan, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. A very, very warm welcome to you. The floor is yours. Hello, now? Yes. yes, perfect, it works. So distinguished speakers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is with a profound honor and a sense of collective purpose that I welcome you to this first E-Trade for All roundtable of the ANCTAD E-Week. In this session, we convene to discuss how to unlock the potential of digital trade for inclusive development. 
a task that demands not just insight and innovation, but an unwavering commitment to partnership and collaboration. Digitalization holds vast promises. Digital technologies are reshaping everything. Digitally deliverable services, for example, accounted for 55% of global services exports in 2022. That's amazing, yes? In such a short time. But these figures hide significant disparities, and we know that. For developed countries, this share was 60%. For developing economies, it was 45. But for the poorest and least digitalized economies, the least developed countries, it was just 17%. The readiness and ability to engage in digital trade vary substantially across countries especially between developed economies and the least developed ones. Such disparities, if unaddressed, risk exacerbating inequalities rather than bridging them. And this brings us to the core of our discussion today. How can digital trade be leveraged for more inclusive and sustainable development? One lesson we have learned in the past few years is the indispensable role of partnerships. As the saying goes, none of us is as smart as all of us. This wisdom resonates profoundly in our context. We need to join forces, pulling our collective intelligence and resources to find new solutions to deliver effective collaboration with countries that are falling behind. The task ahead is not just about harnessing technology, it's about connecting the dots between policy, practice, businesses, and people. By joining the Trade for All initiative, you have all exemplified this collaborative spirit, advocating for comprehensive, cross-cutting approaches to e-commerce and digital trade. Your efforts and specialized expertise are instrumental in shaping an environment where digitalization leads to inclusive outcomes, from enhancing digital readiness to addressing gender gaps in the digital economy. E-Trade for All underscores the power of working together. I am proud to say that the E-Trade for All initiative is alive and kicking. Since it was launched in our ministerial conference in Nairobi in 2016, its membership has grown from 14 to 35 members, and as many as 28 E-Trade for All partner organizations are actively contributing to this E-Week, many represented at the highest level. This is, I believe, a strong testimony to the value that partners attach to our collaboration. As we delve into our discussion, I'd like us to focus especially on what is needed to strengthen the capacity of developing countries, particularly the least developed, to better participate in, in and benefit from digital trade. This is directly relevant to our overall theme of shaping the future of the digital economy. How can we collectively help to enhance trust and security in the digital space, address critical issues like cybersecurity and privacy, and strengthen legal and regulatory frameworks? And how could international cooperation and capacity building support more inclusive outcomes? Or the concentration and power concentration in many of the sectors that we will be talking about. Precisely, I come, as you know, from, from Dubai, from COP28, and uh, we said very strongly there, you know, trade has to be part of the solution. <laughs> for the developing countries, trade and investment are key for any possibility of sustainable development, yes? And they are linked, and the same happens in the digital economy. So we want to be part of the solution, and the solution has to 
take into account the diversity of situations that we are faced with. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that the insights and recommendations from this round table will not only shape the way forward for digital trade, but also reflect our shared commitment to a future where everyone benefits from the digital transformation. Thank you for your dedication and engagement. I really look forward to a discussion that is enriching as it is impactful. So thank you again very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary General, for those words and reminding us, as you all know already, that trade has to be part of the solution. And I can promise you that this discussion is going to be one full of insight, one which is going to help build those recommendations. Now, I'm going to pop down to the floor now so that I can see the people better who I'm talking to, because it's nicer to look at people when you're chatting to them in the eye. <laughs> so welcome again. And Mia Seppo, now you are from the ILO, and in the context of this growing platform economy, and it's growing at a frenetic pace, how does the ILO ensure, and how is it trying to ensure today, that the digital transformation safeguards the rights and well-being of workers, promotes inclusive and decent opportunities. But, of course, as you all know, and it's the holy grail in some respects, protects business interests as well. Thank you very much for that really relevant question and, and thanks to Rebecca for convening us for this critical conversation and, and a very good morning to all uh, distinguished participants in the room. Um, we are looking at a, a impact of the digital transformations and the rise of digital labor platforms as one of these really huge transformations of the world of work. Uh, and indeed, uh, from an ILO perspective, we are strongly recognizing and emphasizing the importance of regulating uh, this space in a manner that recognizes the need for um, labor rights, fair working condi conditions, labor and social protection. But we also recognize that regulating the digital platforms is very complex and in, it involves review of existing legislation, laws and practices and these linkages also across multiple jurisdictions and therefore international policy dialogue and coordination is uh, essential. Uh, it's important to recognize that there's already new uh, forms of regulation emerging. Just to mention a few examples, you have collective bargaining agreements. Uh, in Denmark, for example, you have cleaning workers recognized as employees. In Brazil, you have health uh, legal standards for platform workers. And you also have the discussions right, the right to disconnect and to ob obtain decent price for platform work in the transportation and delivery sector in France. So these emerging collective bargaining examples are really important. You are also looking at efforts to regulate the space, uh, and here, for example, US and UK have uh, taken steps uh, forward. Um, ILO uh, sees social dialogue involving workers, employers, and governments. Uh, as one of the key uh, tools to ensure fair competition and decent work for all. And in that context, uh, we are starting a process at the 113th International Labour Conference in 2025 with the possibility of adopting the first global normative instrument in this domain in uh, 2026. Now, in terms of, of the um, trade side of this, um, you know, you referred, Rebecca, to the digital divide. Uh, and I think it's really important to recognize the importance of providing relevant support to micro, small, and, and medium-sized enterprises in order for them to be able to grasp the opportunities that the digital economy 
um, provides in terms of access to technologies, knowledge, networking across uh, a global market, but also recognizing that if we don't tackle the skills gaps, if we don't tackle the digital divide, we are looking at a very uneven playing field in terms of access to these opportunities. So in that sense, ILO is advocating for programs that provide support, targeted support to the small and medium uh, enterprises in terms of, of skilling, in terms of understanding the regulatory framework, in terms of peer learning. Uh, for example, uh, through our partnership with Microsoft, we have a program that targeted 30,000 female entrepreneurs in 10 countries to help them access the digital uh, market. Um, and in that sense, you know, also looking at, at these opportunities as a pathway for formalization, a very key aspect for many countries in the global south. Thank you so much for those words. And we're going to stay with this idea of SMEs, and we're just going to dig a bit deeper. Um, Dorothy Tembo. Um, now, the ITC does support SMEs in terms of harnessing the benefits of digital trade, and also obviously enhancing their competitiveness. But let's look at the challenges. We've been having some really honest conversations here. So let's look at some of the challenges. What are they, and how is the ITC addressing them? Thank, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you very much for that important question. And may I start by also uh, joining in thanking Secretary General for the kind invitation to be part of this important conversation this morning. In responding to your question, I wanted to preface my intervention by sharing two, two key issues. One, I think, is perhaps what you have been hearing from yesterday and including uh, this morning which we have also established from our side, which is that, you know, it is uh, quite clear to us that in turbulent times, digital connectivity has come to the center of trade. I think this is the message that is being said by everyone. Um, and to us, this can really be what makes the difference between success and failure of MISMIS these days. Um, in order for us to ensure that we are indeed providing that support at the, you know, for them to be able to interact with the local markets, but more importantly, it's the export market that we are really looking at. Um, benefits from this, I think, also have been alluded to, which go beyond just the connectivity and being able to sell, but what it is that we can do in supporting these countries to ensure that we are accelerating and enhancing the inclusion side of it, uh, in particular tackling the entrenched inequalities, uh, such as the gender inequality and indeed uh, on the youth side of things. The second point, which is equally important, is that I wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, particularly post during COVID and post-COVID, from our side we have seen a lot of uh, government, uh, private sector, and indeed development organizations working together trying to ensure that we try and see how we can put, we have been putting in place a number of digital focused initiatives which are working well. And I think it's a, it's a good starting point laying the foundation, but the reality remains that we have to step up and scale and make sure that this is really inclusive for all. Um, so in terms of the specific question you have posed, I think there are many challenges that one would uh, speak to, but probably I will focus my intervention perhaps on four key areas that we really wanted to, to share, which will bring me back to the key points that I wanted to make before I, I close my intervention. I think the first we have almost four thematic issues that I wanted to address with respect to the challenges. First is the access to appropriate market opportunities. We have seen that as one of the main problems. Lack of management skills and capabilities in a new market space. I think that has been one of the fundamental issues we've had to deal with. How do we transition people that have been used to doing business in a very different way to understand that it's also possible, possible using different channels of doing business. Third is the lack of information. 
this has really been uh, one of the key issues. People don't know what is this about. How can I take advantage of this? And how do we scale them to make sure that they are able to do so? And finally, it's the accessibility to the other support services that are around, around us. But there is also an elephant in the room which speaks to access to finance. Because if the businesses don't have access to finance to adjust themselves to be able to take advantage of this opportunity, it comes, it comes to, to zero. Really, they cannot put in place the digital infrastructure or indeed try to address themselves to the payment solutions and overcome some of the related barriers. So what is it that ITC is doing? Like we have been doing in our responses to all the issues that come across to us in relation to, um, in relation to MISMIs, as we often refer to them, we, we look at addressing the full ecosystem. So you're looking at the policy side, you're looking at interventions at the micro, small and medium enterprise level, but we are also looking at uh, ensuring that, you know, beyond that, you're also facilitating the trade and creating that enabling environment. But I wanted to underscore the fact that in terms of our approach, we have really been uh, taking steps that have been responsive to their immediate needs. I think we were all caught up in COVID and there was an immediate need. What we try to do at that point is to really focus our, our efforts on helping those that were already export ready uh, and those that were probably just about to tip over to be export ready because we had to have minimal continuity of trade. So. In the initial phase, this is uh, precisely what we were doing, making with the small firms, equipping them with the tools to be able to do trade online. But progressively, we have grown this, and we are now working with all, all sizes of the MISMIs. Um, basically, in essence, we have that proof of concept, and therefore, we can grow it to make it more inclusive, and here, we have been doing work in, in, in Kenya, working with a broad spectrum of partnerships, not only in Kenya, but across, um, from academia, indeed, with, with others that are coming on board. On access to information, I think this is something that we continue to work on, ensuring that we are imparting that uh, information. Um, I perhaps uh, wanted to, to, to end by saying, Accessibility to training and information are just two pieces of the, of the puzzle. What we have done is to scale this up and we have an initiative that we refer to which is Switch On. As Switch On, it's a program that we are rolling out and uh, that is currently ongoing in Zambia for the past two, two years, but the intent is to really replicate this once we have established what this can do. What is the difference there? The difference is that we were addressing ourselves to specific interventions, but we realize it has to be the whole ecosystem that is addressed, and therefore we are taking an integrated approach in terms of the response, which brings together different partners, starting from Alibaba, uh, Kava, and all the others that we are working, to, working with, including, uh, including the initiative that brings us here today. So this is work that we are going to be building on. Our target is reaching out to 20,000 uh, entrepreneurs by 2025. We are already in the thousands, but we cannot do this on our own. Partnerships are underpinning this initiative, and perhaps I can speak to that a little bit uh, later. Thank you so much uh, for your intervention, Dorothy Tembo, and explaining that so clearly. Um, may I just say, we are short of time, so I think it's very important in these, this initial round that you are able to explain and give the background. The second round, I'm going to be a wicked timekeeper. So um, expect me to be a lot more strict. Um, now, when we talk about all these issues, when we talk about digital divides, when we talk about access to e-commerce, there is often one factor that holds people back, and that is a lack of trust in systems. And so I know this is something that Ansi Trout 
is tackling, um, Madame Joubin Bray, but and is trying to contribute to building that trust. But can you explain to us how you're doing that in terms of digital trade? Thank you very much. Um, so I, I won't skip the uh, necessary and also uh, important thanks for having us here. We are one of the historical or first first year partners of the E-Trade for All. So it gives me a great pleasure to join all this distinguished panel and to be the lawyer in the room. So um, when we talk about building trust, there are two aspects in the digital economy that we've been tackling for many years when e-commerce started uh, appearing, and e-commerce is not new. Um, you had to identify who you were trading to, what you were trading, and establish some transactional rules to make sure that the transaction can be trusted. Now, with and can produce its legal effects. And now, of course, with the digital economy, this, um, this trust aspect is even more important because all the trading is taking place up there, so you don't see who you're trading with, you don't know who is behind the platform you're using, and you don't know what are the rights, the obligations, and the liabilities of the different players in this digital world. But the second aspect of the digital economy, and that goes beyond the ways of trading, is also that in the digital economy, you're dealing and you're trading new commodities, new assets that are, I would say, not really known from the legal nature and what they entail when you trade on them. And I'm talking here about uh, assets like uh, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, like data, of course, because at the, at the heart of this uh, digital economy is all the building of artificial intelligence through data. So you need to access data if you want to have and develop uh, artificial intelligence. But all of this is not a commodity that you've been used to trading. So you have to look very carefully at what it is. Do the old rules of trading potatoes or trading in gold, do they apply? Or do you need to have an, a framework that is more adapted? And you know, just to make a link with what uh, Rebecca very uh, nicely put in terms of how trade can contribute to uh, the, the climate uh, battle that is, uh, that is uh, our joint endeavor. Well, there is a new commodity which is called carbon credits. Nobody knows what they are from a legal point of view. Nobody knows how to trade them. And so I think that is, it's really being at the forefront of these new commodities, these new ways of trading using, for example, our texts, some of them uh, that are adapted for e-commerce, those that are now stepping into digital trade, such as our digital identity and trust services model law, or the model law on electronically transferable records, which allows you complete paperless trade. So really, um, and if I want to keep it short, I think there are two aspects to the legal framework that are absolutely essential and that we can only develop if we have those countries in our room where we work with member states who help us develop these rules and these laws and regulations taking into account the specificities. So we, we are working, for example, on MSME specific frameworks. Well, we have MSMEs in the room. We have representatives of these very small companies. So here we need, if we want to bridge this digital legal divide, we need to have countries in the room that tell us this is the issue and this is what we need to tackle so that it can flow. Thank you. Thank you very much for that timely and important explanation of what UNCITRAL is doing and how it really fits into this jigsaw of um, pieces that have to come together to unlock digital trade for developing countries. Um, Mr. Pradeep Mehta, um, we're going to take a think tank perspective, and I know you represent the Global South. But can you tell us what would be the key policy recommendations that you would have to make sure that the full potential of digital trade is unlocked? 
Thank you very much, uh, moderator. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Rebecca and my colleagues at UNCTAD for inviting me to speak here. Uh, being a member of the Eat Aid for All initiative, we feel proud of this. And I'd just like to mention a little aside that we are also doing a daily reporting of uh, the events here. Those who would like to look out for her. Now, the fact is that <clears throat> developing and implementing, let me underscore the word implementing, uh, inclusive trade, digital trade policies uh, that consider the challenges for the developing world, uh, we have a good model in India, the Digital India uh, Initiative. And what has happened very recently in September, uh, when India held the G20 summit, uh, the declaration also called upon India to provide support to the Global South on developing what we call a DPI, a digital public infrastructure, on which India has progressed substantially. To give you an example, the digital payments which are happening in India today run into billions and probably the largest in the world, about 80 billion transactions in a day, as against even in a, in a country like U.S., about 2 to $3 billion uh, transaction in a day. So there is a highly developed system of digital public infrastructure in India, which India is committed to uh, share with other developing countries, including developed countries as well. Uh, so I thought it is very important. Now, the second important point uh, was uh, in terms of cybersecurity, as was mentioned by speakers, including Rebecca. Uh, that becomes now is becoming more and more critical. It's a sort of <clears throat> third form of terrorism, the kind of warfare which is happening uh, through cyberspace is uh, phenomenal, and one has. To, one cannot underestimate the kind of harm it can cause to the systems which operate. For example, and how it will impact the digital arena itself, power outages, for example, and that leads to all computers coming to a standstill. What do you do then? You have nothing to do except that, you know, just uh, twiddle your thumbs and sit down. That by itself is a problem in a very large number of developing countries. Uh, the issue of our power. Secondly, uh, if you go down the street uh, this way, we have what is called the International Telecommunications Union. That's another very, very major infrastructure input in order to be able to uh, deliver, uh, in order to, to have a good digital trade system or digital economy in the country itself. If you do not have the kind of uh, fiber, optic, uh, or other kinds of telecom uh, intensity, then your digital communications lack. For example, what may take me 30 seconds to download in Geneva, uh, 30 GB file, may take me half an hour to download in Nairobi. See the distance. Now, the kind of loss in speed that you get is itself something. So there was a Rebecca, it is useful to have ITU people also in this conference because without a good telecommunication setup, you cannot achieve a digital economy of any shape or size. Now, one thing which is again remarkable to see is how South Korea has implemented the digital infrastructure, broadband, broadband infrastructure. This is another very critical input in terms of uh, running a digital uh, economy or a digital system, uh, <coughs> then unless we have a good broadband, so now that again costs money. So uh, there was a panel on <coughs> round table yesterday of donors, and I did not hear anybody talking about investment in infrastructure. They're talking in investment in software of the, of the country's systems, but what about the hardware? If you do not have a matching hardware, whatever you try to achieve through the software would not be successful at all, Rebecca. Uh, we fortunately have uh, seen this problem happening, including we are uh, working in a very large segment of rural India. And in terms of digital divide, uh, some of the issues that I've heard here are very uh, interesting. That we have a group of rural women who have been able to access world markets through e-commerce, but 
they were fortunate enough to get good broad broadband connection through the smartphone itself, just a smartphone. They don't know how to operate computers. But even smartphone has now become such an important issue that the prices have come down. Uh, so therefore, that is another issue that has been looked at. Do you want me to wind up? If you could wind up now, that would be fine. Sorry? If you, if you could conclude, that would be okay, great. Okay, so I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, fine. <laughs> But we will come back to you. Okay. Uh, now, how can, let me answer the second question that you raised. How can civil society and non governmental organizations like CUTS contribute to shape, shaping a fair and inclusive digital lead? One is our capacity to research and advocate for an inclusive trade, digital trade policy that prioritizes the interest of marginalized communities. And, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, I mean, we have hands on experience in doing this. So while at one, one level we are speaking in Geneva with you know, good ivory tower research, on the other hand, we do pick up information at the grassroots level in order to see as to how does it, you know, how does it sort of contextualize in the policy space. Thank you. We'll come back to that. Don't okay. worry. We'll come back to that issue uh, in just a few moments. Um, but thank you so much for outlining. You know, the some what might seem obvious to some people, but yeah. the practical things that have to be basically organized before you can even get to digital inclusivity. So thank you so much for that intervention. Um, I'd like to turn to you now, um, Madame Elard, um, because you know, today when we're looking at digital trade rules, uh, let's take a multilateral level look, you know, what the WTO is doing. Um, and can you tell us, please, how these multilateral level rules, digital rules, can contribute to really promoting this greater digital inclusion, particularly when it comes to developmental aspirations. You know, maybe even picking up on what Mr. Pradeep Mehta was saying. Well, thank you very much, Isabel, and, and thank you to my uh, colleagues here at the podium. This is just such a great discussion, and I think it shows that with so many different organizations, so many different approaches, that none of us can solve this alone, and we all need to, to work together. I think that um, to answer your question about the role of the WTO, uh, multilateral rules, other types of approaches, um, I would say there, there really are two truths that we're looking at. Um, the first is that digital trade is indisputably an engine of growth, and an organization like the WTO needs to reflect that. The second, though, is that the digital divide is very real. And it's very real in, in ways that Pradeep had described, and it's very real at the government level as well, both practical and, and government. As Anna noted, trade, digital trade is not like trade in potatoes, but digital trade facilitates trade in potatoes. And there's no way you can really trade now, nowadays unless you're involved in digital trade. And what's the, the beauty of that is how it affects all levels of development and can be such a strong engine for growth. So what is the WTO doing in terms of multilateral rules? Well, there are several things. One is I think there's a, an understanding and a recognition among our members at the WTO that we should try to establish rules on digital trade. Our rules that exist are, are old, they're antiquated, they don't fit the system. At the same time, there is a sense that we need to have a work program. We need to have technical assistance and capacity building to make sure that countries at all levels of development are able to take advantage of the benefits of digital trade. And so a lot of our work is keyed off of that. So of course we partner with um, many of the organizations here at the table um, and many others as well to produce analysis to help 
policymakers target exactly what needs to be done. So that has to be an important part of the, of the package. And in fact, we will be issuing um, a study with uh, some of our sister organizations later this week focusing on um, digital trade for development and opportunities and challenges. But this also has very real implications for us in, in terms of our day to day. We have a moratorium that's in place right now on the collection of customs duties on trade. And that moratorium is set to expire at our ministerial meeting in uh, February. It's renewed from ministerial to ministerial. And so now members are, are, are tackling how this should be handled. We have many developed members and many developing members who believe that a moratorium on the collection of customs duties is essential to, to increasing digital trade and as a tool for development. Many developing countries, however, feel that the moratorium should be ended and that customs duties should be collected because it's a means of revenue. Uh, but we've We've also been undertaking studies, including with the IMF, that show that actually it doesn't collect all that very much revenue if, if you were to um, impose duties on e-commerce. And in fact, um, there are other more efficient ways of, of collecting revenue. So that's just one example. We also, within our multilateral system, um, are able in our founding documents to conduct plurilateral negotiations, so coalitions of the willing, so to speak. And we do have a negotiation that's well underway now on e-commerce uh, that's made up of, of members who want to be part of this negotiation. It's not multilateralized yet, but we hope that it soon will be. This is made up of developed and developing members who see e-commerce um, this type of negotiation as a means to facilitate remote transactions to be able to enable trade and development through e-commerce. We're also doing a lot of work through our technical assistance and capacity building arm at the WTO and we work quite a lot with the ITC in this regard too um, to make sure that some of the, the issues that Pradeep was, was describing can be addressed at, at, on the ground. But the WTO, we set, we set rules, or our members set rules. We engage in technical assistance and capacity building. We don't really fund these projects, but we partner with organizations, international organizations that do. So again, it's part of this collaboration um, that we work in a particular framework, but we work with others as, as well. It's the only way we can address this issue. Thank you so much. And again, emphasizing how important collaboration is. And that's really what this panel is all about. Now, I'd really like to look into something you were just mentioning, um, uh, Angela Ella. And, and that was the, so I suppose, the, what you were talking about, cross-border trade, levies, the challenges there. And, and I'm going to continue with this point, not necessarily with levies, but with Paul Donahoe. Because you know the Universal Postal Union you're leveraging the global postal union to facilitate and enhance cross-border trade. And there are sticking points, as we were hearing. So how are you doing that? Thank you for that question. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic for us. Um, and, and the UPU is, is proud to have joined the E-Trade for All initiative uh, back in its inception in, uh, in 2016. Um, so for seven years, we've been working with our, our partners around this table uh, and other partners in E-Trade for All on addressing some of these um, development issues. Uh, there's no doubt that digital trade has the potential to significantly boost uh, inclusive and sustainable development. Um, it opens up new markets and new opportunities, especially for medium um, and small enterprises and entrepreneurs in developing countries, as we've heard from, from Ms. Tambo. Whilst there is a great potential, the challenge is that many of these small businesses and enterprises are located in underserved parts of the country. Uh, and the underserved and underrepresented face many hurdles to participate. Uh, it's not just technology, as we've heard. Uh, there is also a human element uh, to the digital economy. 
and uh, issues such as language and culture and local support services uh, and skills are really uh, some of the issues in these communities. Uh, and the UPU uh, and the postal sector, uh, which contains over 650,000 post offices in these communities, um, services this global population and plays a crucial role um, hereby facilitating inclusion from all parts of the community and supporting the payment and movement of goods, um, which uh, is resulting from these digital transactions that we've heard about. By ensuring reliable and affordable postal services, they help bridge the gap between digital marketplaces uh, and the physical delivery, making the benefits of digital trade accessible to the broader audience. Um, we heard yesterday in our day one session um, of an interesting experience from the Indonesian post office where over 2.1 million SMEs are accessing e-commerce services from over 5,000 post offices uh, across the islands. There are 17,000 islands in the archipelago of Indonesia, so it's a very interesting environment for the digital economy. And many of these are, are women-led businesses. Um, uh, and um, for cultural reasons, they prefer to deal with women uh, in their services as well. And so there's an excellent example of the cultural issues at the human level. Um, for, uh, for the human touch point uh, of the digital economy. To um, unlock the full potential of digital trade, uh, a, a robust enabling environment is, is required, uh, and this includes reliable and secure digital infrastructure, as we've heard, uh, including clear regulatory frameworks for e-commerce, and policies that encourage innovation and investment, as we've heard. So the postal sector supported by the UPU is pivotal in providing um, the physical infrastructure needed for the delivery of goods, uh, trading digitally. Uh, these post offices can also contribute to sustainable digital uh, connectivity and digital service delivery by contributing to demand aggregation. Um, uh, and post offices as digital hubs are an increasing trend in these communities where um, things like live video streaming, high-speed connectivity, um, capacity building for local uh, businesses, for the local population in local language um, can support these. So additionally, promoting digital literacy uh, and ensuring cyber security are essential for these businesses. Uh, and the UPU is actively contributing to, to partnerships uh, with uh, our We Trade for All partners uh, and between other um, private sector and international organisations to foster this environment for, for inclusive digital trade. We will actually uh, be having tomorrow uh, a trade post forum. We will um, uh, explore some of the opportunities that the post office brings to inclusive um, trade uh, and uh, e-trade for women. Uh, we're proud to have as a partner of, uh, of that forum. And we'll also be uh, recognising some significant contributions with trade post awards. So we'll be able to see concretely how the post uh, is supporting um, inclusion in these communities uh, through um, physical and digital services. Thank you very much. And what I think is interesting there is sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The, the post office is there, post services are there. There can almost be a backbone to digital services, particularly in more remote regions. Um, Mr. Koji Hashiyama. Now, area is, you know, and I don't know if you all know this, but it's one of the world's most influential think tanks. And Research institutions like AREA um, do contribute really vital evidence-based policy-making insights in the field of digital trade and development. Can you share a few of those insights, please? Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to uh, this uh, panel discussion. And uh, I'm, I'm very honored to join this. And uh, uh, area, uh, maybe that uh, many of the audience uh, don't know <laughs> about area, what is area. And uh, yes, yes, where area is at the Economic Research Institute <coughs> and the uh, international organization. And our uh, main target is at the ASEAN and East Asia. 
and uh, by the conducting the uh, economic research, that's so then that we uh, provided uh, the policy recommendation uh, to the ASEAN and East Asian meeting, as well as the uh, G20 or G7 meeting. So uh, our, uh, our role is that's uh, contributing to accelerate the uh, discussion in uh, these kind of the, uh, international organization, uh, international meetings. And uh, also that uh, as uh, the moderators <coughs> uh, mentioned that uh, our role is that also that uh, provides uh, <coughs> evidence-based uh, policy uh, recommendations. And uh, so then that uh, through the conducting the academic research, uh, it is possible to analyze the where they are lagging or the, what the causes are or the, uh, what is their advantage. And then that uh, we analyze well and then uh, making, uh, make evidence-based policy recommendations. And uh, in addition that uh, under the current uh, progress of the digital economy in ASEAN and East Asia, so the uh, policies of the, these countries uh, uh, that support more detail on the specific uh, business activities are required. So then the, uh, our uh, activities uh, is to more focusing on the, to provide the more detailed and practical policy proposals to the, uh, it, uh, every countries. So that's why uh, we uh, establishing the uh, center, new center for the uh, digital innovation and uh, sustainable economies. And uh, this, uh, the role of this uh, new center is uh, to uh, make a uh, platform uh, for uh, collaboration with the uh, policy maker and business sectors. And then uh, we would gather the more uh, opinion over a voice from the business sectors and what is the barrier for uh, prog uh, progressing the digital uh, innovation as well. And uh, also, uh, we are also uh, holding the, uh, we are uh, very focusing on the, uh, how to strengthen the startups in ASEAN. Uh, because of the, uh, the, the uh, startups of ASEAN uh, will be the uh, major player for the future uh, ASEAN uh, digital economies. So uh, that's why uh, we are holding the uh, event or the matching or uh, marketing or some others. And through this event, uh, <coughs> uh, we are aiming to establish the uh, startup ecosystem in ASEAN and East Asia. And through these activities, uh, we uh, is, uh, now uh, would like to uh, make a more uh, business-friendly uh, evidence-based policy proposal. Uh, to the uh, ASEAN uh, and the East Asia meeting. That's what I uh, kind Thank of. Thank you very much. Thank and you very, very much. important work indeed, providing evidence based reporting and supporting uh, startup ecosystems. So we've heard from all of our speakers now. And if I look at the time, we've just got half an hour left, and there are seven of you speaking. And I'd love to go to the floor and get some questions. So in our next round of questions, I'm going to be looking at the time and asking you to keep to two minutes, if you possibly can. And if you are going over, I'll probably make a sign. But I, I would like to go to you, uh, Angela Elar, um, because I'd like, and in this round, we're going to be a bit more future focused, and we're going to look at best practices. And could you share some of the reflections of the work you have done? And, you know, giving us practical guidelines in connection with digital trade particularly maybe in the work in Africa, that the World Bank, the, the work you've done with the World Bank on that all important handbook on measuring digital trade, because you need to measure. Well, thank you for the question, Isabel. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be very quick in, in keeping with your, um, <clears throat> with your rules. Um, so on, uh, with, with respect to Africa, we have, um, just issued a joint policy note with the World Bank that is an effort to look at exactly these issues that, that you describe as a, um, <clears throat> what can we do as a, as a practical matter? So I think the first things are to focus on the connectivity infrastructure 
um, types of things like that that are that are very practical, but also not just the hardware, but the regulatory framework and what exists um, in, in terms of facilitating trade and regulating trade in a way that, um, that uh, with respect to digital trade, make sure that the, the structure is in place. So the, the facts, certain facts I, I, would, I would point to, questions like privacy, uh, questions like uh, liability for what you uh, post online or what is involved in particular uh, digital transactions, all of these are very important. I would also point to skills. So making sure that when we talk about facilitating digital trade, particularly with developing members, that we're also talking about building skills. So the first aspect of this problem is to identify all of the issues and all the various components of the issues. And then where the WTO comes in is to try to provide the technical support and capacity building. So that has to be part of it uh, in order to, to help try to solve um, the particular problem. So in this particular um, uh, joint policy note that we've done with, uh, with the World Bank, there are three steps. So the first is identifying it, the issues. The second is a uh, pilot program working with seven members in Africa, seven of our WTO members, to see how we can address these particular issues how in a very practical way. And then our final third phase is to expand beyond these seven to, to see what kind of real practical effect we can have. Thank you very much. And um, what I'm really enjoying is the very practical hands-on approach of what we are learning about today. I'd like to turn to you, Dorothy Timbo. Um, and can you tell us a little bit in, I suppose, what ways can international cooperation, because ultimately this is what it's all about, it's about partnership. How can that international cooperation and capacity building support, as we are hearing just now from uh, Angela Ellard, how can that support more inclusive and sustainable outcomes um, for digital trade. And we heard from uh, Paul Donohoe about women, more inclusive trade when it comes to women. Thank you very much uh, for that question. And I think uh, DDG Eland um, summed it up very well in saying that the level of ambition we have is really one that is huge. The issues that we have to deal with are, are ones that spread across uh, different uh, segments of stakeholders and you know, government administration as well as other, others that are involved in this process. And therefore, where I, from where I sit, partnership is really a must have in all this because not a single one of us at this table, as she said, can deal with the issues that we have to address if we really have to attain that level of ambition. Leveraging resources, both from a financial perspective, from an expertise, is one that is going to be uh, critical going forward, building on what we have been doing up to this point. But I just wanted to add one dimension which perhaps we slightly spoken to, but maybe not so much emphasized, which is that for us providing technical assistance, we are going directly to what has been requested of us and perhaps limited in terms of the scope of the mandate we have. But we heard earlier, I think, from Pradeep that, okay, you can do all that you have to do in, with respect to training. What happens on the infrastructure side if that is not in place? Which is why I, I perhaps would come back to what I was saying earlier on, which is an integrated approach that deals with issues that we can address as partners on E-Trade for All, but also going beyond that at the country level. How do we get the government institutions and the other institutions to actually understand what it is that has to be addressed for us to be able to have the level of outreach we are looking for, the inclusiveness that we are looking for, and understanding that that inclusiveness might bring us 
to a point where we also have to bring in people that don't necessarily sit with us on a daily basis and understand the language that we are speaking. How do we provide solutions that they can work with and include them in such a process? So from our perspective, I did speak to the collaboration we have with CAVA, and I will not go into detail, the work that we did in Nigeria, but we also have been working with GM, GSMA to co-chair a joint working group under the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, but these are just a few of the partnerships that we have been pursuing. Suffice to say that everybody at this table almost we have been engaged with and very much look forward to working with others that may not be working with us at present. Thank you very much, because as you say, this work is articulated around you actors, but also the other 44 members, if I remember rightly, of uh, E-Trade partners. Um, so, Madame Jouabret, let's continue then with this idea of partnership, but let's take a, a legal look at it, you know, because the legal practicalities are essential. How can, and can it, in fact, can unsea trials support more inclusive and more sustainable outcomes for digital trade? Can it do so for women? Because we've been hearing about the issue of women. Does it have limitations? Thank you very much. Yes, that's a, that's a great question you're, you're asking because um, Inherently, the law is for everyone. It applies across the board and it doesn't single out uh, particular um, actors or uh, particular sectors. And especially when you work on harmonizing, you have to take into account that the policy priorities are not necessarily, are not necessarily easy to harmonize into a model law on, say, digital trade. Um, so basically we do not single out and we do not in in our legal frameworks that we produce we do not um, pay particular attention to women entrepreneurs or to uh, to men entrepreneurs but um, you, the, the way to approach it and the way we address it is through our um, dedicated frameworks and work for MSMEs. So when we work and when we prepare more guidance documents, so that are not hard law, but more guidance on how to uh, favor certain types of activities or certain types of issues, there we can look into uh, the, the specific issues that, uh, um, that are women are confronted with and I would like to uh, reiterate what my colleagues have said already on this panel talking about an elephant in the room it's true that um, in, in our view there are really two elephants when we talk about women entrepreneurs and MSMEs in this digital trade sector the first one is how to encourage to move from the informal part of the economy into the formal part of the economy because until you really exist formally the government can't do anything for you, you you're just a non-entity you're you're working yes you're you're doing your business but you cannot benefit from any of the policies and the, even the law that the government is putting in place and the second one very clearly to me is access to credit because, you know, I was last week in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Ghana, and in both countries they have wonderfully clever wizards that develop these uh, tools, these apps, these, this, this, uh, these structures for digital trade. And, you know, comes a certain time, they all move to the United States because they are, they are welcome, they are funded, they have uh, sustainability in their business. Um, as a perspective and so I think that's that's really an issue where it's really important to focus um, having of course all things considered having the the right legal uh, framework in place when you want to really focus on women and women entrepreneurs is to look into the way they can access credit and there are there are ways ranging from family uh, funding to crowdfunding to the spectrum of secure transactions 
All of this exists, but it needs to be plugged into the digital uh, framework discussion when you want to particularly address women. Thank you. Thank you very much. So work still to be done there, but really interesting. The, the points that you make there, in terms of formalizing, particularly with work women do, and then stopping the brain drain, which uh, I think is vital. Let, you know, in some respects, what you were talking about was broaching on logistical issues. So I'm going to go to Paul Donohoe here. Um, now, to look at some of those logistical issues when it comes to postal services and the gaps they can fill in terms of developing countries, developing e-commerce. Yes, uh, um, this is a, a very critical challenge. And, and as I mentioned uh, before, then the UPU is working with uh, member governments to try and address these, uh, these gaps and these challenges. Uh, but I think I want to pick up on what has been said um, already, in, and partnerships are vital um, to be able to address these issues. Uh, and we have to break the silos uh, and leverage the expertise that we all have um, within this environment where we're talking, um, but also to uh, encourage governments also to take a, to take a whole of government approach to d addressing these challenges uh, and, and developing the, the the digital economy and bringing the benefits that it can for inclusion of all of society and that's where I think uh, e trade for all has uh, has been a marvelous um, platform to at least uh, help facilitate that dialogue uh, with uh, within the the community that we represent. Uh, and in concrete terms, um, uh, the, the collaboration uh, on the assessments um, that eTrade for All is doing to assess the challenges and assess the, the logistical challenges, the addressing challenges that exist in many countries and provide guidance on uh, government's intervention in those areas, uh, I think is a, a very concrete step forward. Uh, and, and I wish to congratulate uh, UNCTAD uh, for facilitating this collaboration as part of these E-Trade for All assessments. From the UPU side, we are also um, working with, um, uh, for example, the African Union uh, on roadmaps for digitalization of postal services and enhancing the logistics uh, environment uh, in, in African countries to help modernize postal services and, and assist them in delivering this all-important connectivity for communities. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to come to you, Mr. Pradeep Mehta, um, very briefly, if uh, you could. C could you just tell us, from your experience, again, we're staying with these practical measures, concrete measures, uh, how civil society and non-governmental organizations like CUTS can really contribute in terms of enabling this fair and sustainable digital environment? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me pick up some strands of conversation which we have heard so far and see as to how I can present a more cogent uh, picture out of a project which we've been running for a long time and uh, very successfully. In order to reduce the digital divide, one is, uh, spoke about postal workers. Uh, in India, we have about 500,000 post offices, of which 300,000 are run by what are called extra departmental agents. They are not employees of the postal department, and they work as gig workers. Uh, I mean, they work as gig workers. What has happened is there is a facility which is available, and many of them are women as well. So we have trained them to be computer savvy uh, over time. They run e-kiosks, a uh, very large number of uh, services in India, death and birth certificate, passport, etc., ration card, and so on and so forth, are today all available online. You can make an application online. So there's a huge advancement. And that is what we are trying to do, is to build up this over, uh, I think, about uh, 5,000 villages. I mean, that's all what we can handle, but that's a good model for anybody to see as to how do you combine many of these things. And we work in collaboration with all the institutions which are here on the table, uh, including area. We're doing policy research with them. Uh, with UPU, we are on the consultative committee. With UNCTAD, of course, uh, <laughs> I don't have words to explain. 
WTO, we work very closely. Uh, I'm on the WTO DG's NGO advisory body as well. Uh, with ILO, we do a lot of work. Uh, we, uh, we did a, an event at World Investment Forum with the ILO's participation in, on ESG and worker satisfaction, you know, worker welfare, something which is totally ignored. Uh, with ITC, Dorothy is again a very old friend. We work a lot with ITC on trade facilitation, among other things. And with Anna Zuba on the investment, uh, investor states disputes. We are a, I mean, a large organization in that sense, so therefore we work on a, a rainbow of issues. But having come back to uh, the digital economy, what I would like to say is uh, it requires persistence, uh, like any other thing. These, these are not sprint races, they are marathon races. So one has to have patience in order to see to it that things. And when you are dealing on digital divide with, uh, with, with uh, semi-literate population, then you have to have much more patience in order to see when sometimes you'll be surprised as to what they can come out with, you know, which even you would not have thought of. I mean, don't underestimate the common sense of the common people. Uh, this is, again, a very important uh, learning that we have discovered over a long time. I'm going now, to have to stop you there, if I may, if we just stay with that idea of don't underestimate. Now, no, one sense. thing, no, one thing I just wanted to okay. add, what I did not add, an important thing was uh, many of our uh, rural workers are also banking correspondents. You know, so and India has one of the most banked uh, population in the world. It reaches out nearly 90% of the population. Thank you. And digital uh, is a way forward. Thank you very much. So, sorry to interrupt you there, but I would like to get some questions from the floor. But first of all, just a quick question to Mia Seppo, because we're taking a future-focused look here. Um, and I sometimes wonder if artificial intelligence is taking almost a step too far when it comes to developing countries, or whether they can jump on board now, particularly when it comes to worker rights. How is the ILO stepping into that future and making sure workers' rights, particularly in developing countries, will be protected? Thank you for the question. Um, I think what we all recognize is that AI will have huge implications for the organization of work in both the Global South and in the Global North. So ILO is doing a lot of work to do analysis and deepen the understanding of what will these transformations mean and how can we ensure uh, a manner of incorporating AI in the world of work that ensures productivity, that uh, enhances innovation while upholding workers' rights uh, preventing discriminatory practices and also promoting just transitions. Uh, and coming, you know, uh, this event comes at the same time as the COP28. So when we talk about transitions, we talk about care in terms of aging societies, digital and green. And this, of course, has different implications in, in different uh, countries. I think the area of understanding these far-reaching implications is an area of collaboration in terms of the analysis and the research that many of the institutions uh, who are speaking in this panel uh, do. So ILO did a study in, in 2023, and, and I think everybody expected us to come up with a big stark warning in terms of the impact on jobs, and it actually showed that the fear of job substitution might be a little bit overemphasized. Uh, we see an opportunity to augment um, through the latest way of AI, uh, which of course is linked then to skilling. Uh, when it comes to augmentation and the effects of automation, the impact at the moment is expected to be 5.5% of total employment in the global north and 0.4% for low-income countries. So therefore, very different policy responses are needed. Um, ILO is expecting that, that AI will impact on the quality of jobs in terms of uh, work intensity and, and autonomy, and hopefully give more opportunity for engaging work without limiting workers' agency um, and voice. So when you then look at the power uh, balance, we are looking at ensuring that workers uh, affected by labor market adjustments uh, can operate in, in an environment where there is respect for existing norms and rights, 
uh, and where, where we use national systems for labor and social protection and skills training uh, systems. I think it's important, and it was re said by one of the previous speakers, that the regulation of AI so far has not sufficiently taken into account the effect on working conditions. And in that sense, of course, from an ILO perspective, we very much encourage countries to use existing mechanisms for social dialogue and tripartite consultations, uh, bringing in the voice of workers, employers, businesses, and government to ensure that the policies and the regulations that we design support an orderly, fair, and consultative uh, transition. And I just want to, there was a reference to the human touch point by mm -hmm. one of the previous speakers. That human touch point is the workers. And that human touch point is the micro and small economic units. And I think this is really where the, the, the kind of things come to a crash when, it, uh, uh, when we look at this inclusivity and fairness. Uh, and I think that's why this uh, discussion that UNCTAD is facilitating is so uh, important. Thank you very much for those important points. Now, we, we've got about five minutes maximum for a few questions from the audience. Maybe we can grab a couple of questions at once. Please go ahead. And who is your question for and who are you? Thank you. Um, my name is Hassan Al-Kilani, Ministry of Economy, UAE. Um, welcome back from Dubai, Rebecca. Very different weather, huh? Um, the common basically point I've heard here was the uh, digital trade. So can we proudly say digital trade is taking over instead of e-commerce? This is number one. Number two, if this just, is the case... Just one question. We're never going to get time for two. That will have to be your favorite one. Okay. Is digital trade taking over from e-commerce? And I think, this gentleman, you have a question too. Thank you very much for uh, convening this panel, this important panel. Uh, well, I will speak uh, on behalf of 134 states, uh, because today we are not representing Cuba here, but uh, we are representing the G77, as you know, in the chapter of New York. Uh, and I would do it uh, in, in, in Spanish uh, to make, uh, um, because we are also heading the group of friends of the Spanish of UN, so we are not going to be forgiven if we speak English today. So, hemos uh, visto. We have seen and noted with great concern, and on the panel we've been able to see this, that there is a huge digital gap. Today, we're talking about trying to meet the 2030 goals. And it has been clear that within the UN system that won't be possible. It won't be possible for us to meet the development goals for 2030. That's especially the case after an awful pandemic which has set us back a great deal in terms of sustainable development goals. For instance, today I have seen that the panel has heard many questions about the internet, infrastructure, fiber optics, digital trade, but Today, around the world, on 360, only 360 million people have computers. Half of the world's population today doesn't even know what a computer is. And that half of the population has never even seen a smartphone. Nevertheless, when you look at these data and compare them with digital penetration, for instance, there's a study uh, which I'd like to draw on stating that 82 percent of electronic trade takes place in developed countries. The remaining 17 percent or so, which takes place in developing nations, mostly happens in Brazil, India, China, Indonesia, Turkey, and Russia. So, this is the digital gap we have today, the digital divide. It is gargantuan and we have to work together without ensuring that we don't overlap in our mandates because there are many mandates. I'm looking towards the moderator. I know we don't have much time. Perhaps during another panel 
we'll hear from other panelists, but it's clear today that we need a global digital compact. We need that because the mechanisms we have to address the huge divide between developed and developing countries is a necessity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as that was more of a comment than a question, I think we have time for one more question and I shall go to you, Minister Naoni. I had two questions, but I'll just ask one. The other one was about, I think my colleague from Cuba has covered it about the, the gap between our poor and affluent communities when it comes to um, digital economy. But the one I will ask, I'm, I'm sure, I want to ask my sister, Sepo. Uh, workers are workers no matter where they are. But have you thought about what kind of a worker are we now going to have when we have a digital economy? And then what kind of labor rules? Because most of them are going to be more sedentary, uh, sort of behind the desk, and uh, there a lot of health issues because of uh, just focusing around a computer and gadgets. So what labor rules are we developing to protect such workers? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'll let Mia Seppo jump straight in there and uh, answer that question while it's still fresh in your mind. Thank you for the very pertinent question from Zimbabwe. I think uh, many of us are sitting, you know, thinking about well, our backs and what have you. So a very pertinent question indeed. So um, ILO is getting into a process of, of looking at the first global instrument uh, in this domain. And that starts at the 113th International Labour Conference in 2025, hopefully concluding in 2026. And this conversation between workers, employers, and governments will look at a lot of the definitional issues. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, the changes are fundamental in terms of how labor is organized, including definitional issues of contractual status and, and workers. So that conversation will take place in the tripartite uh, governance mechanism that ILO provides. Uh, when it comes to uh, worker well-being, and of course there is a lot of lessons learned from COVID in terms of, of worker well-being, uh, the occupational safety and health is now one of the fundamental principles and rights at work, which is one of the key advocacy areas for ILO with partners, and a lot of the work that we are doing with our member states in terms of processes of ratification and uh, implementation. And this process of, of looking at a global instrument will also look at those uh, huge impacts in terms of how work is being uh, transformed and that expectation uh, of what is likely to be uh, automated or augmented and what the future world of work will uh, look like. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vetter promised me he has a comment that will be 20 seconds long because I'd really love to get final comments from everybody at the end. So if you could start thinking about those, I'm going to get you to summarize your final thoughts in 30 seconds because we've really run out of time. So <laughs> the floor is yours, Professor Vetter, 20 seconds. Right. Uh, in terms of collaboration, I just wanted to share with you, which is relevant to e-commerce as well, is a competition policy which was mentioned. This afternoon, uh, with, in partnership with UNCTAD and WTO, we are organizing an event on what is called the World Competition Day. Uh, 5th December is the World Competition Day. This is being held in the afternoon at the WTO premises. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that invitation. Okay, so let's get to our question um, there from uh, Hassan Al-Kilani. So that was uh, whether digital trade is taking over from e-commerce. And I'm sorry, but can you make your answer brief? I will make it super brief, yes, 100%. <laughs> to, to just explain two, two fundamentals of digital trade, the way of trading, platforms, the platform economy, 
the fundamental, the second fundamental is what is being traded? Digital goods, digital assets. So that for me is very clear that, and then I said it yesterday, that e-commerce was commerce for my generation, but the ones that are now coming into being active and, and, and driving the economy are definitely digital. Thank you. Two fantastic questions. Thank you very much. It's time for your final thoughts now. And as I said, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot because I'd like you to keep them to 30 to 45 seconds long. And you know that there's an AI algorithm that's going to be taking these and basically synthesizing them, although you'll have synthesized them already. So um, let me begin with you, Dorothy Tembo. 30 seconds. Partnerships matter. <laughs> from making sure that MISMEs have access to right information to support informed decision making and services for taking part in digital trade and to finding innovative ways to close the digital gender gap in particular. Um, it's important that we ensure that we have customized solutions with specific targets in mind. A lot of information given on who can and who cannot be a part of this, but I believe that there are solutions, how we can consolidate this and make sure that they too are part of the inclusion process. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Madame Joubin Brett, I'm gonna to turn to you. Um, well, if you want 30 seconds, I will do less. I will say that I totally agree with my colleague who just spoke. Yes, indeed, partnerships are extremely important because we don't come with the same value added, but all together we can add a lot of value. Thank you. Beautifully put. Um, Mia Seppo. So we, we are looking at uh, hoping that the digital world and digital trade will be a world which is more equal. How can that happen? That can happen by ensure, ensuring equal access of opportunities to everybody for workers in terms of skills, decent working conditions, and labor and social protection, and for uh, small and medium enterprises by, by ensuring access to opportunities, bridging the digital divide, and ensuring that they can actually harness the potential for both productivity and innovation. Extremely succinct and full of meaning. Thank you very much. Um, Paul Donohoe, I shall go to you now. So, final words, uh, I think digital trade, um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that that's both digital and human and physical. Uh, I think that complementary um, initiatives in physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure need to be um, a priority. And finally, um, come to the Trade Post Forum tomorrow uh, at 11.30 and you'll hear more practical examples of how the Post is working to achieve that. Two invitations, and we love invitations. Thank you so much. Uh, Koji Hashiyama. Uh, th thank you very much for uh, promoting the E-Trade. Uh, I'd like to uh, think that uh, there are two key, po key points. That one is, uh, of course, of inclusiveness. And then that, uh, especially that uh, for uh, the gender issues, that was also important because, because our research also showed that uh, through the COVID-19 that uh, gender divide, uh, digital divide was um, extended more and more. And uh, the other one is that uh, the rule and regulation uh, should be uh, not within the specific region, but also that's uh, connected outside the region. So the global uh, activity, that was important. And the one, another uh, key issue that's uh, changing mindset, uh, that was very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Angeli, Angela uh, Paolini Ella, please. Thank you. Well, I think it's clear from this discussion that we need rules. And we also, the other part of the equation is we need to address the practical effects of how, uh, of, of e-trade, of digital trade, of e-commerce, all of the various uh, permutations. And there's a lot at stake because Digital trade is more than just about trade in digital products. It covers every single aspect of trade. But I think that makes it a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity for empowerment, perhaps to help us fix some of the mistakes of trade in the past. 
um, to be more inclusive, to include women, MISMEs, uh, uh, communities all over the world, whether it's in developed members that have uh, tremendous pockets of poverty and also our least developed countries who need uh, so much that this is uh, really the, the advent of digital trade provides such an opportunity if we get it right. But we can get it right only if we work in partnerships. So that's organizations like ours. It's national governments working together. It's the private sector being directly involved and of course civil society as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pradeep Mehta. Let me respond to the points raised by the gentleman from Cuba and some lady from Zimbabwe. Hello, madam. Madam. Hello. Ms. Leone. Hello, I'm responding to the point which you addressed, which I don't think has been addressed by others. Uh, I mean, we worked in the developing countries in a, in a long way. It is the development which is the problem in order to reach that, break that digital divide. Uh, how do you, so the, your governments have to prioritize the spending. And look, these are enabling tools. You know, digitization is an enabling tool and that will help people to overcome their poverty, you know, have extra income, uh, so on. So the prioritization is important. Uh, this is what you have to tell your own governments to do in order to ensure that this is what India has done and very successfully. Every village is now connected digitally. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final concluding words will go to Rebecca Greenspan, obviously the Secretary General of UNCTAD. Thank you. Let me just say this. Nothing will happen automatically if we want to close the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will require policy, it will require investment, it will require resources, it will require rules, it will require good governance at the global level too. Yes, not one country will be able to do it alone and not one organization will be able to do it alone. And so it has to be a decision and there has to be a political will to get it right. Exactly. So the gaps won't deepen and the opportunities will be spread for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with those concluding words, please give our speakers a big round of applause. And as they have so well pointed out, partnership matters. Good to see you.